So we're now going to learn about some frequency response techniques that are, I would say, um, they're, they're grounded in uh, the Boda plot and the Nyquist plot, which we haven't done the Nyquist, but we've done the Boda in the past. So um, the these techniques are uh, very tightly coupled to these two frequency response plots. So the techniques aren't graphical in and of themselves, but, and we won't really um, dwell on the graphical aspect to the point that we can construct some beautiful sketch of everything, but we just want to be able to get a rough sketch from uh, uh, our techniques that we're going to learn how to sketch these things. And one of the reasons that we learn how to sketch them in, and that we learn how to uh, construct them manually is that we'll know how to adjust them. Like we'll know what affects these, these graphs. Um, and the, these visualizations, they used to be more, they used to be used as like actually like the design tool themselves, the graphical part was a design tool. Nowadays, it's more of a, a way of thinking about it to help guide us. Instead of looking at a formula that's impenetrable, we can look at a graph that makes sense. And when we think about definitions that we haven't talked about yet, like the gain margin and the phase margin, um, those will be intuitive to us by thinking of the plots. Okay, and that's, that's why we focus on the plots first. We've got to be able to construct these plots. Uh, and then we'll later be able to, be able to um, use these to do controller design. Okay? So the Boda plot is what we're going to do in, uh, well, 1.2 is about the Boda plot. 1.1 is an intro to these frequency response techniques. Um, so the frequency response function, h of j omega, is a complex function that relates the system's input u to its output y in terms of the input's frequency content, right? Um, given a transfer function, h of s, which also relates u to y, um, but it's constructed differently. Uh, the frequency response function can be found by the substitution. We can just plug in j omega anywhere we see an s, right? So we just take the transfer function and plug in j omega. Where is the line? There we go. Stylus does you no good if you don't plug it in. So. Hopefully that is very much review for everyone that you can find a frequency response function that way. Um, the transfer function is, I would say, the more um, commonly worked with object in, in a lot of uh, uh, situations. Finding the transfer function, uh, like for instance from the model that we have for our project, um, is pretty straightforward. We can find it from our state space model using that nice formula that I mean, it's C times SI minus A inverse B plus D. Those, that's gives us our transfer function from each input to each output. Uh, since we have a, uh, well, at least we could consider it a single input, single output system. Um, it's certainly a single input system in our project. Uh, single output depends on what we want to see out. But the the uh, transfer function only is, has one value. It's one transfer function from one input to one output. A transfer function, um, we are going to think about it in terms of the frequency response function because that is uh, where we get the idea of, of a... Um, uh, a spectrum, right? We don't really think about the spectrum until we've got a frequency response function. And 
we plug in s equals j omega in the transfer function, and we've got it. You can also derive the, the frequency response function from the Fourier transform, which um, I did for you guys in system dynamics, but you may not remember. I, I would understand if you didn't remember that. Uh, I did this to it today in system dynamics. <laughs> That's why it's on my mind. It's fresh. Uh, but you can find the system or the frequency response function either way. Uh, it can be shown that uh, for a system with an input being just a sinusoid uh, with amplitude A and angular frequency omega and phase psi with A omega and psi being real numbers, um, uh, then the steady state output is whoops yeah no uh, so you guys may or may not remember this that y oh that y of t in the steady state is equal to the input amplitude times the magnitude of the frequency response function times sine. So you put in a sine wave with an amplitude A. You get out a sine wave with amplitude scaled so A times some scaling factor, which is the magnitude of the frequency response function. The sine, the sine, so it could be attenuated or it could be amplified. Because it could be on resonance, for instance. That would be one way it could be amplified. Uh, and the sine wave is, is at the same frequency, the output is at the same frequency as the input. And we have the original phase, and then we add in the phase shift which is the phase of the frequency response function at each frequency omega. So, uh, so this is the magnitude of the frequency response function which so h of j omega, the frequency response function, is a complex valued function, right? So at some frequency, omega, it's just a complex number. It, it evaluates to a complex number. So a complex number we know has a magnitude and it has a phase associated with it. You could think of it as either having a real and imaginary part. So we look in the complex plane. If this is a real, the real axis, this is the imaginary axis, then a complex number has has a, a real part and an imaginary part, right? But it also, we could think of it as having a magnitude, which would be the ray from the origin to the complex number, uh, and a phase, which is this. So this changes depending on omega. And that's, uh, this is one of the, I would say one of the main results of system dynamics is this interpretation of a system where if you have a sinusoidal input, you get a sinusoidal output at the same frequency with just the amplitude changed and the phase changed. And how that amplitude changes is that it gets scaled by the magnitude of the frequency response function. And how the phase changes is that it gets added to the phase, the phase of the original signal gets a, uh, uh, summed with the phase of the frequency response function to give you the output phase. So, um, this is a really important result and there are three striking aspects. So the output is also a sign, is, so it's a sign you sort of the same frequency as the input. That's the first striking observation. The second one is the output amplitude um, is the input amplitude scaled by the magnitude of the frequency response function. And the third 
striking thing is that the output phase is the input phase plus the phase of the frequency response function. So clearly, the magnitude and phase of the frequency response function are muy importante, right? I don't even know if that's proper any language. <laughs> but it's important, right? So we got, we, got to know, we got to learn about those two. And that's why we plot them uh, in two different ways. So what we're going to do in the Boda plot is we're going to plot magnitude on one axis versus frequency. And on the other plot, we're going to plot phase versus frequency, right? That was the Boda plot. And then in the Nyquist plot, we're going to essentially plot this in the complex plane, the real and imaginary plane, and we're going to change values of omega implicitly, and we're going to trace out what the magnitude and phase, or what the, what the complex value evaluates to. Okay? So they are two different ways of plotting a complex function of omega. Another way you could plot h of j omega, the frequency response function, since it's a complex number, we could plot the real part as a function of omega. We could plot the imaginary part as a function of omega. Why don't we do that? I have no idea. This has just never, never been a thing people have done. Apparently, I've never seen it before. I mean, but it would be totally reasonable. I don't know why we don't do it. I really don't. So. I, I will say that the magnitude and phase are very important, so that's what we're mostly interested in here. Yeah? This might be what you just said, but I don't really know. But mm -hmm. um, why is it h of j omega, why is that a complex number if it's just a function of j omega, which is purely imaginary? Uh, so, j omega, so okay, there's two things happening here. First off, it's weird that we put the j in there in the argument. And, of the function. So why do we do h of j omega, not h of omega? Like, like what's up with the j? Um, it's just convention. I have no idea why they decided it was a good idea. Some people, uh, a lot of physicists, don't put the j in there. I don't know why they don't do it. But for whatever reason, they don't do it as much. We like the j. So there you go. Uh, engineers like to put the J in. I think it's just to remind us that you plug in S equals J omega. And I think that's why. I, it, what it, I think part of it is also that technically, if you're going to plug in S equals J omega here, then your frequency response function, you shouldn't use the same symbol, H, for H of S and for H of omega. But they wanted to. So they just did. And they just stuck the J in with it to make it like slightly more proper, but like totally not. So this is why mathematicians just cannot fathom what the hell engineers do um, with math. It's like we just we just use it, and as far as they can tell, we are so far lost in just sin after sin that that we're just irredeemable and they don't even they don't even listen anymore. It's just over it. I've had conversations with mathematicians when I've tried to be very mathematical and very proper, but it's so hard. Like it's just so hard. They're like they have no concept of of like physical intuition or anything like that. Like they're just they're just like what are the definitions? That's all. Like that's that is it. We're all like trying to think about how a vector moves, and they're like, "What do you mean a vector moves? Like that is that means nothing." <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, they're like, "You mean there are vector-valued functions of time?" Okay. <laughs> that is an actual thing. But then they would say, "Well, time." I, of some variable, a real variable is it, or is it a complex variable? Well, it's a real. Okay, so then yeah, so like it's really, it's can be it can be harsh. Uh, all right, so with Fourier series and Fourier transform representations of signals, we can consider the input to be composed of sinusoids. Remember that whole argument in system dynamics that we went through was that 
you can write a Fourier series for a periodic signal. So sinusoids are obviously periodic, but square waves, sawtooth waves, those are periodic. So we can write a Fourier series representation of them. And they have frequency components that show up at multiples of the fundamental frequency, right? We learned how to do that. Um, and then with aperiodic signals, so what is an example of an aperiodic signal that we have talked about a lot? A ramp, a ramp is an aperiodic signal. Step. An exponential impulse. Those are all. Those are all uh, transient, or they're sometimes called or aperiodic signals. And the Fourier transform can be used to represent those signals in the frequency domain as well. Those signals have frequency components associated with them. They don't show up at multiples of some fundamental frequency, they show up all over the spectrum. They could use any frequency um, in the Fourier transform. So suffice it to say, by hook or by crook, by the, the, the Fourier series or by the Fourier transform, we can write some frequency description, some spectral representation of, of uh, Virtually any signal. I mean, there are limitations on them, but for what engineers care about, essentially any signal we care about, you can write a Fourier series or a Fourier transform for it. So, um, for linear time invariant systems, the principle of superposition allows us to construct a corresponding output representation. So, if you think about this equation applying to each frequency, then this is how we could interpret uh, uh, sort of spectrum coming in. So you could think of all the spectral components going in, you know, one at each frequency if it was, say, a, a periodic signal, uh, and we had discrete frequencies at which those uh, occurred. At each frequency, we would be able to find what the steady state output is, right? So we would just have to find what is the magnitude of the frequency response function at that frequency, and what is the phase at that frequency. And we would be able to uh, take the input spectrum and filter it through the frequency response function. Okay, And we did this back in system dynamics. That's why I'm not going through all of it. But um, suffice it to say that that's one of the big motivations for doing Boda plots and doing uh, uh, frequency response thinking is that. That was what w was done originally before we started doing controls in, frequency, in the frequency domain. So, uh, in section 1.2 and section 1.3, we introduced the two primary ways that the frequency response function is plotted. Section 1.4 explores uh, what we can learn about system stability from h of j omega and its plots. So that's to come. Um, the sections here, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, they're like lectures. Um, we're going to do 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2 uh, in the next seven minutes. Not really seven minutes, but we're going to try to, uh, I'll try to uh, wrap it up soon. I know you guys probably want to go. Uh, okay, so finally we learn uh, how to differentiate time domain and frequency domain representation, or, or how the different time domain and frequency domain representations of a system are related in section 1.6. The frequency response methods of this chapter were actually developed before root locus methods and are equivalent in many ways. So we just had an exam over the root locus methods, or that was our main focus. And uh, we could think of this as being another way of looking at doing controller design. And it actually came before the, the time domain stuff did, which is interesting that it did. I mean, like, I think it was like a decade before. Um, uh, we learn these methods for two reasons. First, they give us a deeper understanding of control systems. And second, 
There are a few situations for which frequency response methods are preferred, and these are those situations. The first situation is when constructing a transfer function from measurement data. So, let's say that you have a system that you want to characterize, and you don't really know what its transfer function is. You don't have a great way of modeling it, or maybe you just don't trust the model that you have. Um, so you want to construct a transfer function, um, and so <laughs> you guys might be looking around. So th our project, this is an example. You know, we could construct a transfer function from measurement data for our our system. That might end up being the best way to go. Um, one thing we could do is you can do a, a mixture too. You could you could sort of fit your model to the data that we could get out. And I would love to teach you guys how to construct a transfer function from measurement data. It's really cool, and I think that it's a really great thing to learn how to do. So that might be something we do in this class. Yeah. It'd be cool. Um, so you don't have an analytic transfer function. I mean, you could try to fit one to it, but you just have data that just tells you at a given frequency you can interpolate what the magnitude of phase are, right? So you have like essentially a Bode plot, but that's it, like nothing that is behind the Bode plot. So you can try to fit it to some model, and maybe you can, um, uh, but maybe maybe you can't. Maybe it's just you know it's not clear what model would really fit this. Um, you can, you don't have to come up with one to do your Boda, or to do your root locus analysis, you have to have a transfer function. You have to have roots that you can put on there and do your root locus plot, right? If you don't have a root locus plot, you can't come up with a root locus plot experimentally directly. You have to infer a transfer function before you can get that. So that's why this me these methods you can use just the Boda plot, essentially the data, because you can always measure what the magnitude and the phase of your frequency response function are pretty easily. By putting in, there are multiple ways of doing it. One way, you hit it with a hammer impulse response. You can back it out from that. That's not, well, it isn't bad. You just have to repeat it a bunch of times. Um, another way to do it is to put in a sinusoid at several different frequencies, which is probably the better way to do it if you have the time and the capacity to do it. Um, that's what we would do for this situation is we would we would um, put in different frequencies into it and then measure the uh, the, ma the magnitude of phase of the output um, so lots to talk about there so I gotta keep moving uh, when designing a controller so this is the second time when it's preferred to use the uh, frequency response methods the, the, um, over the uh, time domain ones. When designing a controller for transient and steady state response characteristics with lead compensation, so sans leg compensation. So if, if, you're, um, if you're doing just uh, lead compensation, um, it is actually a little bit better to use these methods um, and when determining the stability of a nonlinear system this is the way to go as well um, so these are like the three times like if you come up with these situations frequency methods are superior in other cases like it could just be six or half a dozen like it's not necessarily one's better than the other um, so you can just try you, Oftentimes, you might just try both just to see what you come up with um, from each one. You might learn something from doing it both ways. Okay, so that is the extent of the first lecture. That was just an introduction. And now we're going to talk about Boda plots, which we've already done. This is all review, but I do think it's worth going through quickly. Okay. So. Um, 
So Bode plots are uh, plots of the magnitude and phase versus frequency, omega. A Bode plot is a useful graphical representation of the frequency response of a system. So let the magnitude of the input, uh, so this is the magnitude of, you could say the complex amplitude of the input, um, or you could say this is the magnitude of the Fourier transform of the input. Um, and uh, y is the Fourier transform of the output or the complex amplitude of the output. So recall the magnitude of the frequency response function can be expressed as, oh, I keep doing that. Um, Lost my. There we go. Okay. So the magnitude of the frequency response function I don't know why the X won't go away. It's because I'm not on my system. Gotta lock that layer. There we go. I have this stuff all worked out in shortcuts that I don't have right now. So, all right. So that is just the ratio of the magnitude of the output magnitude divided by the input magnitude. Okay. This is a ratio of amplitudes, and so is akin to the amplitude ratios commonly expressed in decibels, okay, dB. Remember decibels? Good old decibels. However, the magnitude ratio of equation 1.3, which uh, I didn't, I don't know why it's not labeled. Oh, it is, 1.3. Good call. Um, uh, it's not dimensionless. So for instance, in our project, the output is the, a position, right? Like, say it's meters, OK? And our input is voltage. So this ratio is in meters per volt. That is not dimensionless. And decibels is dimensionless. Does that stop us from still calling it decibels? No. Who thought this was a good idea? I don't know. I don't know. It's weird, but it's something that we do. We just, we just do it. We call them decibels, but when you actually interpret the unit, you have to make sure you recognize it's decibels only in the loosest sense of the term. And it's actually, um, if you convert it back to a linear scale, you're in meters per volt. Okay? All right. Uh, also, um, the footnote might be amusing. Um, for more details, see the section on decibels, C.1, which I haven't written yet. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, it is standard usage in system dynamics and control theory to use the familiar formula to compute the logarithm magnitude, so h of j omega magnitude, so uh, sometimes we'll put a little subscript db down here, sometimes we just leave that off because we like to be confusing and inconsistent in our notation so that only people who have a lot of patience can become engineers. So the magnitude of h of j omega in the linear scale, uh, we plug in to this, we take log base 10, we multiply it by 20, and we say this is decibels. <laughs> but like, we probably should like quote that decibels. I am very uncomfortable with calling it decibels. Can you tell? Okay, so the phase is usually plotted in degrees, 
and the omega axis, the frequency axis, is logarithmic in both plots. The two plots are typically tiled vertically with a magnitude plot above the phase plot. We'll now work a simple example. So we'll do a simple transfer function and we'll say what's the what's the Bode plot? So let a system have transfer function h of s equals s, a single zero at the origin. Find the frequency response function and draw the Bode plot for the system. So, gave us some space here to work. So, from equation 1.1, so from 1.1, uh, we get that h of j omega is just equal to the transfer function h of s evaluated at s equals j omega, right? So if we plug that in, this is just, the transfer function was just s, so we just stuck j omega in. Whew, that was not very difficult, was it? So, uh, this lies on the imaginary axis, right? So if we look at the complex plane, we've got this, and if I got a different color, magenta, we'll call it. This is j omega, right? This is length of omega. Um, assuming omega is positive, this is it. If omega is negative, it goes the other way. Okay. So, uh-oh, let's see if I made any, if that did anything bad. So, uh, our magnitude then is going to be what? In terms of omega, of course, function of omega. It's just going to be omega. It's, really, it's the absolute value of omega. Uh, if we just consider positive frequencies, which we are in this case, then that's just omega. And if we wanted to know what it was in dB, air quotes dB, uh, we would just do 20 log base 10 of omega. All right. Um, the phase is the arctangent of the imaginary over the real, right? And what do you guys remember? So I, imaginary part's omega. The real part is zero. So do you guys remember what that goes to? It essentially, it goes to 90 degrees. Feel free to calculate it, but it goes to 90 degrees. Oh yeah, yeah. It's the arctan, arctangent of the imaginary over the real. So omega over zero. And the Bode plot is. So it's really easy to plot this. So this is. I've got our nice. Uh, db axis and our logarithmic omega axis and my phase as well and degrees so it's all set up for me I just need to knock them down magnitude is 20 log 10 of omega and so if omega is equal to zero what is oh sorry not equal to zero we can't do a logarithm of zero what, is, what if uh, our center of our graph here is at 10 to the 0, which is at 1, right? So what is log base 10 of 1? 0, right? Uh, what is 20, uh, so what is log base 10 of 10 to the 1? is 1, so we're at 20, so 1 times 20 is 20 dB. And what is 
log base 10 of 100, 2, so 40. And then it goes essentially the opposite as you do 10 to the minus 1, etc. So you get this line that goes, straight line that goes like this. And so my dots were a little off, but don't be alarmed. It is just a straight line. Okay. Uh, we said that the frequency, or that the phase was going to be a constant 90 degrees. So that doesn't depend on omega at all. So that's just not that. Whoa. Um, that's just this, right? 90 degrees all the way across. So those are our Boda plots. No problem. And you can always do that. I mean, anytime you have the transfer function, you could just plug in s equals j omega, plot points. And that's why MATLAB can do it so easily. That's all it does, is it just, bam, plugs in points. Gives you a plot. This, uh, we just plugged in points and gave us a plot. Our sketching that we learned, the sketching techniques that we learned, are just ways of coming up with the, a sketch of these Boda plots without having to do uh, point, uh, point plotting for every transfer function. So, and actually, um, if, if uh, our transfer function is pretty complicated, then this is going to be a really difficult complex number to compute. And this can be, if we found the magnitude and phase, that can be a very complicated expression. It can be really messy. Um, so this is why we're going to turn away from that method. And we're going to go towards sketching based on the transfer function alone, not the frequency response function. And we're going to construct it from lower order systems. So it turns out that when plotted on this logarithmic scale, recall that the omega axis is also log logarithmic. The magnitude and phase are quite asymptotic to straight lines for both first and second order systems. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I missed this. So the, the degree is just 90 degrees the entire way through? Yeah, the phase is just 90 degrees the whole way, yeah. We plugged it in, and so I will, I will say uh, it's 90 degrees. If omega was going to be negative, it was, the phase would be negative 90 degrees, right? So. This is assuming omega is positive. Um, so both magnitude and phase are asymptotic to straight lines for this system, but it's, I mean, they're actually identical to straight lines. But for first and second order systems, so first and second order pairs of complex and real, real well, so first order real roots and uh, so uh, zeros and poles and complex conjugate pairs of poles and zeros are primarily result in pretty straight line asymptotic to straight line um, Boda plots and that's why we'll learn to construct higher order ones from these lower order ones um, this is our sort of our, our method so uh, Furthermore, where did the, uh, the rest of this go? I skipped the page. There we go. Furthermore, higher order system transfer function can be rewritten as the product of those of first and second order. For instance, if you had some, like, uh, so this would be one zero, and how many poles in this transfer function? Three. So one, zero, and three poles. You could split this up um, into a constant term, a zero transfer function by itself, a, a pole transfer function by itself. And depending on how it factored out, you might be able to do two more poles by themselves, or uh, this could be a complex conjugate pair. I, just assuming that this ends up being a real number, and if you were to factor this out, it would be a complex conjugate pole pair. 
Um, you usually would not factor it out if that was the case. Um, so you can rewrite it like this. So you might ask why. You know, why would you rewrite the, the, the transfer function in this way? Um, and we're going to find out why now. So recall from, for instance, phasor representation that for products of complex numbers, phases, so we'll do phi as the phases, they add, and magnitudes m multiply. For instance, if you had this complex number, m1 is the magnitude and phi1 is the phase, and you had this one, m2 is the magnitude, phi2 is the phase, and m3, and phi3, like this, they would combine by multiplying and dividing the magnitudes, right? So m1 divided by m2 times m3, and summing the phases. So phi1 is positive because it's in the numerator. Phi2 and phi3 are negative because they're in the denominator. So we sum the phases. And if one takes the logarithm of the magnitudes, then they add. Okay. For instance, if you took the log of m1 over m2, m3, then the log property of multiplication of products um, gives you that this is equ equivalent to writing log m1 minus log m2 minus log m3, right? So this is why we're going to do the, the, the decibel, the, bo the, the logarithmic version of the magnitude plots, okay? So there's one more link in the chain first. Um, first and second order boda plots depend on a handful of parameters that can be found directly from the transfer functions, okay? So it's going to be the time constant, it's going to be the natural frequency, damping ratio, etc. So there's no need to compute the magnitude and phase of the frequency response function. In a manner similar to example 1.1, we construct a Boda plot for several different types of transfer functions. And once we, uh, and once we have these simple building blocks, we'll be able to construct sketches of higher order systems by graphically adding the log magnitudes and phases combined by summation. And that's what we've learned in the past how to do, and I'm going to just set you free to do that. So the rest of this is just going through a real zero at the origin, or so a real polar at the origin, real zero at the origin, um, a real pole and a real zero, magnitude and phase, etc., and recalling that we have these straight line approximations for them. So they go from you know, 0 dB up to the break frequency, and then they're at negative 40 dB per decade, and all of that. So this is just kind of, that, that's all review, just reminding you, and then it gets to sketching the Boda plot. Well, we have these products of magnitudes, but they end up being sums when we take the logs, right? And so we can sum them up in magnitude and in phase. So we do each one individually after we break it down like this. We plot each one individually with straight line approximations, and then we graphically add. And that's our hand sketching of Boda plots. It's not bad. I do know that it's a little intimidating, and if it's been a year since you've looked at this, you certainly are going to need to have some refreshing of it, but it, it's not uh, too much to um, get through. So we, I think how I have it split up is that there's not, there's not homework due for like two more weeks, I think, in this class. Um, and it's going to be on, like, you're, you're going to be doing like full-on Boda based design and Nyquist based design in those problems. So I'm not giving you guys review problems to do and a quiz over it. But since you have like two weeks of time to, you know, just hang out, uh, clearly that's all you'll be doing. Um, you might want to consider going back and looking at some Boda, Boda plot examples from back in the day so that you'll be ready to go on that. All right, that's all I'm going to do um, for today, and we will continue. There's more about the project today.
Um, well, 